compassion is very much uh, uh, deep in my heart right? because I grew up in, a, in the Chinatown and I've seen a lot of the, uh, uh, the people who are struggling you know, with life. Today, we don't see these people so uh, uh, obviously in Singapore, but unfortunately, there are still many. Okay? So I think we really have to extend our hand to help all those uh, Singaporeans who are, doing, who are not doing so well. So that, that is uh, uh, the first part of compassion. Of course, in order to carry on um, uh, uh, doing more and to promote compassion in our society, I think at the end of the day, we have to come back to understanding what is work and we must grow to, uh, 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 to like work, okay? That, that is the starting point of what I want to say today, actually, yeah? Uh, because uh, to me, work, is everything. A lot of people will say that, wow, work is hard, you know, and all that. I, but work to me is really, it defines my life. I always ask myself what work I want to do for myself and for society at different stages of my life. Okay? And, I, and whatever I do, I want to uh, uh, consider whether the work I do today, I'll be proud of many years down the road. So work really defines my life. Uh, some people may say it's workaholic, but actually I don't think I'm a workaholic. I just choose the work that I want to do. And in a way, that is the kind of society and the kind of education system that we want to have in our country, whereby every citizen, as far as possible, can choose and do the work they like and not be forced into a job you know, that they don't like the work. You, you hear very often that I like the job, but I don't like the work I do, you know. So uh, I, I hope that situation will not uh, be there. You choose the work first before you, you know, think of the job. So uh, first of all, work is what really uh, defined uh, uh, my life. Okay? And uh, just now Adam has uh, spoken in uh, quite great length. Uh, of my uh, 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 career in the financial industry. But actually right now, what I'm doing is I'm a parliamentarian. Okay, so I work in the parliament. Okay, and the parliament is a place in every country, uh, in a democratic country especially, that make the law for the country. And that is very important, right? Because the law will affect the lives of the citizens. Like for example, if parliament decides that homeschooling is illegal, you cannot have homeschooling in Singapore, right? So parliament is the place where they make the laws. So I think that in the next stage of my career, my current uh, stage of my career, I would like to put some, uh, 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 I would like to do some work in parliament. So as to ensure that the policies that comes out of parliament, do not affect the lives of the Singaporeans negatively. And if some of the policies we can't avoid and have to, uh, some policies may be bad for some segments of Singaporeans, but good for the majority of the Singaporeans, we may have to implement those policies. But even then, we must ensure that those Singaporeans who are affected negatively will get some form of compensation to reduce the, 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 the hardship on them, okay? So that is the kind of society we want. Uh, we want to have uh, policies that minimize the disruption on uh, uh, people's lives and actually increase the potential, increase the opportunity for them to realize the potential. That is where uh, uh, parliament you know, becomes a, a, a very important place. So currently I'm spending almost all my time uh, trying to be a, a good parliamentarian, trying to be a parliamentarian that serves the people and contribute to the lives of the people. How do I actually become a money man? Okay, actually I become a money man uh, uh, by accident. When I came back from Japan, I had my, uh, uh, I studied in Japan uh, uh, for my first degree. And I, when I returned from, uh, uh, from Japan, there was a time where uh, uh, Japan was a very uh, uh, economically 
a powerful country. Actually, it's in the late 80s. And uh, the stocks and bonds market in uh, Japan was doing very well or poised to be uh, uh, doing uh, very well. So the Singapore government, uh, which manages a, a huge amount of reserves, uh, posted me there uh, because I speak Japanese language. So it was really an accident. I'm sure there are many more talented Singaporeans, uh, my peers who are better than me, but because I speak Japanese language, uh, I, I was required at the, uh, at the government to help to uh, invest in the Japanese market. So I was posted to a government of Singapore Investment Corporation. Uh, this in short, uh, we usually call it GIC, uh, which stands for actually Government of Singapore Investment Corporation. Okay. That is the place where our government put all our money into one big pool and then manage the money professionally. Okay. Where the money comes from? The money actually comes from all our savings. Okay. The Singaporeans save are very high savers because we have the CPF system. Every dollar, every hundred dollar we earn every month or every year, 37% of it goes into the CPF. So you take, if you look at the Singapore economy as a whole, that means every $100 the whole economy earns, $37 go into the CPF. So this becomes a savings. You can a savings, and these savings belong to all of us. But at the same time, the government also, uh, in the course of its governing the country, it taxes Singaporeans. And if it collects more taxes than it spends, then the government will have a excess, will have some surplus. And this we call budget surplus or the government surplus. And this surplus becomes a savings for the country too. That means they take more taxes and spend less. So there's a savings. And this savings is also added to the pool of uh, uh, reserves or money that we managed at GIC. Okay. So one, we have the CPF savings. Two, we have the government surpluses. And a lot of the government surpluses, by the way, also come from the fact that not only government collect taxes, but government also sell land every year to the tune of about 10 to $15 billion. So as a result, the government usually has about five to $10 billion of uh, surpluses. That plus about $40 billion of uh, CPF contribution every year from the Singaporean workers. That total is about $50 billion. And that is the excess savings that we put into the pool of uh, 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 money at GIC. And that money is turned into uh, foreign currencies because we, we won't be investing the money in Singapore because Singapore is a small economy. We do not have a lot of opportunities. Uh, so these savings are actually recycled into foreign currencies, mainly US dollars. And then GIC is supposed to manage the pool of US dollars. So this uh, uh, money is actually uh, um, uh, uh, our people's money, okay? And currently, uh, 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 thanks to the fact that our economy is still growing, our people are still uh, uh, earning higher and higher uh, uh, wages, a uh, higher and higher uh, income. But actually, um, right now, our economy is also encountering some uh, inequality problems. While the whole economy is growing, so the total income is growing, the distribution of the income is not very fair at the moment. But nevertheless, every year, the overall income of uh, our country is growing. So as a result, our savings is still growing. And as a result, our reserve is still growing every year. So despite the fact that we were affected by the COVID-19 over the last two years, uh, and we have to draw down on our reserves of up to about $45 billion to fund all the uh, policies to help the economy and the people, we actually also accumulated additional reserves over the last two years. In fact, we accumulated more because of the fact that uh, the, uh, 
the foreigners have put more money into Singapore in the last two years, meaning in 2020 and 2021, because of all the geopolitical uncertainties in Asia. And recently, the latest development is that uh, in China, because of the COVID lockdown, uh, many Chinese have less confidence in the government and money is moving out of China again. So as a result, you can see that uh, 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 this in Singapore today, we are actually experiencing quite uh, fast uh, rising inflation uh, and also uh, a lot of price in the, uh, and also accelerated uh, price inflation in the property market because the rich Chinese and the rich Asians are coming and putting money into Singapore. Okay, so um, um, being a money man, of course, I, I, uh, my job is to deal with money and actually understand the workings of money. So money uh, uh, is very important to us, uh, for us to actually lead a comfortable life and to realize our potential. But at the same time, if there's too much money in the economy, like I say just now, it will cause prices to rise faster. And that we call inflation, okay? Inflation can be in the form of price inflation in, our, uh, in the uh, daily goods and services that we consume. Like for example, I don't know whether you have heard from your parents uh, uh, in recent days that your bowl of noodles, uh, the price of a bowl of noodles have increased, for example, from $4 to $5 or even maybe $6. Okay, or your tuition fees have been increased for another 20% or things like that. So things are really moving up. And, and if inflation is uh, moving up too fast, that will not be actually good for the economy as well because uh, that will cause uh, further, uh, uh, there will cause some disruption in the economic activities because when the uh, prices move up too fast, then you find that the wages of the workers are not catching up. And then you will find that, you know, the uh, social inequality in the, the, the society will worsen. Okay, and then the economy slowly will get into uh, a conflict between the employers and the, uh, and, the, and the workers. So we do need to control inflation to a certain extent because inflation uh, by uh, uh, rising too fast, it will also be a stealer of wealth, they call it. Uh, Meaning, you know, there are some people in our society like the uh, retirees, they have fixed income. Their income is not going to increase. If you work in the, in the economy, you, there's an issue of uh, you, uh, you and your uh, employer can, can negotiate and then decide whether your wages should go up or not. As I say just now, hopefully our wages will keep pace with inflation. But there are also a large segment of the uh, population, there are retirees, or the lower income uh, Singaporeans, their wages and their income is not going to increase. Okay, so as a result, when their income is not increasing, but inflation increases, that means their, their, their money, they don't have enough money to spend. In the past, they may be able to eat, you know, uh, they may be able to spend, uh, uh, they may be able to have uh, 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 one bowl of noodles every day, but as inflation continues to go up, they may only be able to afford Two, uh, one bowl of noodles in two days. So as a result, the standard of living will drop. Okay, so we have to be very careful. And uh, when we are, when are dealing with money, money also affects the economy. So we have to be very careful about how we actually control the growth of money and inflation. So all these reserves, coming back to the reserves, uh, they are managed uh, by the government on our behalf. Uh, in order for the reserves to grow every year, at the end of the day, it also depends on our economy continue to grow. And so that in turn actually means that the work we do in the economy, coming back to work, uh, has to improve, has to upgrade over time. So, so only when we do good work and our uh, product and services are, 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 are are of high value and appreciated by the world and they buy the goods and services from us that we can generate, the foreigner buy the goods and services from us, from us. Then we can generate more GDP, more value for the economy. So money is the result of hard work. 
we can manage our money more efficiently to give ourselves uh, more uh, uh, financial resources to have a better uh, uh, life. But at the same time, what drives the, uh, uh, the, the growth of money is actually the real work that we do in the economy. So as a result, today we have to uh, be, uh, we really have to look at um, how we can actually make our economy more competitive and more uh, high value add. High value add usually comes from innovation, creativity, and people opting to be entrepreneurs. So this is something that the government has been also talking about, okay? The uh, uh, innovation, uh, creativity, innovation, and uh, entrepreneurship. However, currently in Singapore, we are not quite there. We are quite weak in able to generate all these kind of uh, uh, companies that really uh, 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 runs on uh, or rely on innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. We are more, uh, we have more companies that rely on cheap labor, bringing in cheap foreigners to Singapore, and then uh, to maintain and sustain the business. This is something that the government has been doing and something that I have been uh, 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 offering an alternative view in parliament to tell the government that to forever, if we forever run on a model of getting cheap labor to come in and, and, and run up and, and have those businesses uh, in our economy, instead of uh, reducing or, or controlling the growth of cheap labor, forcing a little bit, the, uh, force the uh, companies more to uh, upgrade themselves with technology and to uh, groom their workers so that they are more productive. If we don't go along that direction, then our economy is going to stagnant at a very low productivity level. Okay. So there's something that we are um, debating in parliament. And uh, so actually it goes back to how do we, gen how do we groom Singapore to be able to become workers who are highly productive, creative, and innovative. So that is where education comes in. And that's where I'm actually very interested to actually uh, interact with uh, you all uh, because homeschooling is an important uh, option when we think about how we can have a better education system. And I'm very glad that all your parents have taken a very uh, uh, decisive uh, and uh, very, I would say, very daring decision to actually put all of you on homeschooling. Uh, and, uh, uh, but that is going to be something that I think we have to take into consideration the experience that you all have so far when we think about how do we make our education system more in line, in tune with the requirements of the new age. Today, we are in the information age. We no longer require people who just memorize things, who just go by the book. That kind of training for, for our young uh, citizen is actually, for, is actually according to a system, which is partly still uh, like the current system. The current system is actually an extension of that system where it requires the, uh, to train the citizens to just become industrial workers. They memorize the manual and then be disciplined and then work as a part of an assembly system. That kind of education system, uh, the, the education system we have now is still an extension of that system. And that system was actually, in my opinion, developed long ago in Europe in the 19th century, where the European nations were, uh, uh, were competing with one another to become the, the world leader. Okay, uh, specifically, uh, England was the first to have attained industrial revolution. That means the first England or Britain was the first industrial nation, followed by France, and then Germany was trying to catch up. So Germany was the one actually who put in a very, uh, very organized education system. And then after that, all the countries follow. And more or less, that is the kind of system that remains until today where you study the basic knowledge 
uh, memorize the uh, basic uh, knowledge and, and be disciplined in applying the knowledge. That is what is required from an industrial worker. And, and since about 20, 30 years ago, we have already entered the information age. We do not require just industrial workers. We, indus we require knowledge workers. Knowledge workers are, 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 are people who actually uh, do their work with the information they have and then with creativity and all that. So as a result, I think the, uh, the education system we have today has to, uh, has to reform and, uh, and, uh, and actually giving more time for the, uh, uh, for the students to do their own self-learning, to do their own, to, to, to enrich their experience. And we, we should actually uh, pay more attention to the emotional development and also the social skills in our education process before we emphasize actually knowledge uh, or intelligent uh, development. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that to develop the EQ and the SQ before the IQ should be actually one thing that we consider for the education going forward. And I'm, I'm sure uh, in the homeschooling curriculum or that, I, 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 I think, I imagine that you all have far more leeway to develop the EQ and SQ than what is happening in the public schools. So that is, uh, I think, uh, what uh, I actually want to say in a nutshell. Uh, I, I hope to, uh, you all can give me some feedback and, uh, and ask some questions and I can share more of my experiences uh, through the question and answers. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good morning. Yeah, thank you for your sharing. Uh, I'm Zhen Xin. I'm, I have four kids, like 12 to 3 plus year old. I find it quite interesting, Your last, the last part of your sharing, where you say that in homeschooling, we have more chances to uh, develop EQ and SQ. I think SQ will be a social quotient, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, because actually, the majority of the people we meet, the first question, when, the first question they have for us is that, oh, you're at home, but you don't go to school, then what about your social socialization? So I find it quite interesting that you think that we, our social quotient will actually be higher, uh, we have more opportunities to develop that, right? I just want to hear your views on that. Yeah, so maybe next time we can also help to educate others. Yeah. Okay. I think I just uh, uh, base my uh, comment on the fact that uh, uh, in homeschooling, probably you have more time. You can organize more activities uh, apart from the, uh, you can organize more activities. So through those activities, you can actually uh, still help the, the, the children to develop the uh, social quotient. More so in, in, in the public schools where uh, uh, the children or the uh, either the children and the students are hard pressed to do a lot of unnecessary work. I think uh, in terms of uh, maybe uh, even sometimes uh, additional uh, classes for students may also be redundant because they are going regurgitating the same thing. It's not very tailored to the, to the, to the specific needs of the, 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 the child. And so uh, there's a lot of time wastage, I think in, in the public schools. So it is only based on that, that I think that you, you all probably have more time to be able to uh, give uh, different, more different uh, kind of activities to the children. And as a result, that enhance uh, their, their, both their emotional and their social development as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leung. This is yeah. really very encouraging, I feel, to everyone yeah. who is hearing this. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So uh, if I can add one more point, so it is also something that I think uh, 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 public, the public system, uh, that means the government can actually come in to help uh, to, to integrate the good points about homeschooling and the, uh, what is lacking and uh, try to enhance it. And then eventually maybe to, uh, to then change the, the current public system. And uh, I think the current public system actually requires a lot of changes. And, and if the, uh, the changes have taken place, I'm sure uh, many of the homeschoolers will also find that the, public, the new public system is actually good enough 
uh, is actually better. And then uh, in the end, we may come up with a, a, a much better system uh, that merging the, 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 the good points of both the public system and the homeschooling system. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. so um, just to add on for the, um, from what Chen Xing said for the socialization part, right? Yes. Uh, initially, so uh, my kid, my child is still very young. He's just 2.5 years old, so he's not here with me now. I'm, I'm just mm. interested to listen in, uh, to what you were saying. Mm. So uh, just to add on about the socialization part, right? Mm. Um, when I started to homeschool my kid, a lot of my friends were also quite skeptical. I didn't know how to start and the socialization part was also the part that scares me because you are not in a setting whereby your kids see uh, friends on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah, but I realized that when it comes to homeschooling, right, um, the parents are the ones who have, who have to put in the effort to bring out the socialization for the kid. Meaning to say that if you don't bring your kids out and your kid just stay at home, then obviously there's no social aspect. But uh, you have to be the one to form your networks um, and 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 find the activities and also so that your and also of course when your child go, goes older which I can't speak for that now because my child is still too young to plan for himself mm. yeah but as your child goes older then you got to teach them the skills uh so that they learn how to socialize so mm. uh that was I guess one part that I wanted to add on for what Jensing mentioned and mm. then to what you shared just now um because you also mentioned that uh, how education how can our current education groom new age workers. But mm. currently now we are talking about information age. And mm. I guess what you are trying to ask is that you are trying to see if there's any way we can improve the current education system so that uh, we can actually uh, go together with the information age and also bring out creativity, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah I think uh, this is very interesting because uh, it's just coincidentally, just a few days ago, I was talking to my husband and I, and I was telling him that um, the current education system that we have, the standard ones that we go to that we go to school, right, was very uh, effective in the past. But right now, um, it is not so anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's not relevant to current society. But at the same time, I feel that it is very hard for uh, uh, politicians to actually change it because it means uh, it means that it's a very discreet reform, you know, and and um. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of thinking to find like exactly what you want to change in the education system, right? And mm. also, um, um, obviously, when you change something, there will always be backlash from the public. No matter whether it's good or bad, there will, people will have something to say. And I think that's also something that's um, pressurizing because everyone has different views about how a new education should be done. But if you talk about um, uh, creativity, right, I do. I, I feel that uh, the current education system does uh, stifle creativity because uh, just from my personal point of view, I'm I'm currently 31 years old. So uh, my education was probably about 10 years back, plus minus 10 years back, right? Oh. Um, when I was studying, um, I tried my best. Uh, I'm not the best student, but I'm not lousy as well. So I managed to go anywhere. I still graduate with honors. Uh, but it was very tough. It was very, very tough for me. And when I was studying, I felt I, I, I was thinking, I always thought to myself whether there is a way out of this. And back then, when I was studying, I never knew there was such a thing as homeschooling. So I thought that in Singapore, there's no way, but you actually have to go through the education system and just try your best uh, to um, be good lah, in, in, mm. in the whole competitive uh, system. But mm. uh, because of this entire uh, landscape, um, I felt my creativity. So many mm. that as I grow older, because um, homework uh, becomes a priority and studying mm. becomes a priority, um, mm. I have less time to do things that I would like to or I could actually be better in, which uh, will be which actually is less regarded at in school. Mm. Uh, it can be drawing, it can be any form of homework question. But I feel mm. that these are the things that um, is very important for creativity. But uh, and when you stop doing what you can to actually bring out your creativity, so sooner or later, you just don't know how to be creative anymore. Mm. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. So, um, if you talk about new age workers, right? Um, mm. I don't really have a very. I mean, I I definitely don't have a colleague suggestion on what can be changed, but definitely I feel that students uh shouldn't be in classrooms for. Too long. 
uh, there should be some breaks or something in between and and there should be i don't know some freedom to pursue something else out of um textbooks it is very hard to say because in current uh in modern singapore uh we are very uh grid conscious yeah, yeah correct i mean i have been when i was younger i was grid conscious so that's why i always look very hard even though i'm not the best student and that's my um Take away for now for that. Thank you, Mr. Leong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is Xin Yi, right? Xin yes. Yi, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Xin Yi, yeah. Xin Yi, you have, you have actually covered a lot of points. Uh. All the points are very relevant, actually, for, for our policy considerations, actually. And, uh, mm -hmm. and actually, most of them we have actually covered. Also, uh, we, have, uh, we are actually currently considering. Uh. So for example, uh, first of all, the first point you make about the uh, the SQ uh, thing uh, the the social quotient how to be developed the social skills and all that you see the the current uh, while it may be um, uh, there may be disadvantage uh, to the homeschoolers to a certain extent but at the same time uh, if you're uh, organize enough network activities uh, networking activities and all that and for example one thing I remember uh, even for myself I've always reflect on the fact that in the process of upbringing my children, I have, because we are very busy, we invited very few friends back to our home, even though we are not homeschooling. But then I think, first of all, you know, increasing the uh, 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 opportunities are for the children to interact with other children uh, that are uh, children of our own friends, actually is a better way of interaction, right? Then actually also to allow the children to interact with our friends, the older, um, the, I mean, the, 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 the parents' friends. It's actually a very good learning experience for them also. So, and uh, what I, I'm very concerned is that, uh, I'm very uh, concerned is that in schools today, we don't really teach uh, uh, students the basic things of about uh, uh, empathy, of about, you know, uh, for other human beings. So in schools, it's always about competition, competition, competition. So that is actually um, um, doesn't help our, our, our children in acquiring social skills, even though they are in, in a school. You know? Only some will be able to, to acquire the skills, and usually these are the, the smarter ones. The average students will probably found, find that the environment in our public schools are not very conducive for their development, in my opinion. So that's one thing that I think that as a result, there's still advantage in uh, uh, adopting the, uh, I mean, in taking up the homeschooling approach uh, because you can actually create the environment even for uh, social skill development. Second thing you touch on uh, the, the public system uh, with its emphasis on examination. And as I say just now about learning through memorization, learning the manual, learning the, the, the set, uh, uh, the, 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 what I call that, the, uh, uh, a confirmed set of knowledge, and then your answers also must be a confirmed set of answers. You cannot deviate from the standard answers because if not, then you won't score an A and then all that. So that sort of education is really, really out of date. And, and, and in order to cultivate the, uh, the talents of the, uh, the children uh, uh, better, actually, we need a system that's more tailor-made okay, to the child. And fortunately, actually in Singapore, we have actually enough resources to actually tailor make our, our education uh, system, uh, tailor make our education package for each of the child differently. Okay. So without having to pressurize him or her to actually uh, be under a constant process of being assessed, as long as he or she can pass a particular subject eventually maybe the, the smarter ones take you know one year to pass but the slower ones take three years to pass but if the the the, the, the subject maybe where we say okay it yeah uh, uh the, the the child really want to become an it programmer okay but under our current system we may say oh you don't pass this subject maybe say mathematics huh? oh you cannot be a programmer that shouldn't be the case because the current system we ask the kid to ask the ch child to pass in one year right but we should allow the system tailor made, allow him to learn, you know, and uh, and he may pass as long as he passed uh, uh, that 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 hurdle. Uh, maybe one of the hurdles is to pass some basic mathematics. As long as he passed the mother, let him advance, let him advance. Yeah. So that is what I mean by a, a tailor made 
you know, different pathway kind of uh, system, uh, which my uh, fellow uh, parliamentarian Hazel Pa has also uh, uh, presented in parliament uh, before. Uh. So this is something that I think is very necessary. And uh, the problem with today is that, uh, like you say just now, it is not easy to come up uh, with a new education system because the problem is many uh, parents, they are treating the education system just as a differentiator. Uh, they want to differentiate their child from other children. Okay? And hopefully their child will get a hate way, you know, a hate start vis-a-vis -vis other children. So that is something that, uh, there's a mentality that we, we ought to change. We should, we should gear ourselves to a mentality, we should change ourselves to a mentality whereby we want to develop the full potential of the child rather to say that, oh, today my child must do better than uh, A and B. You know, we must say that we should encourage our child to, to develop his percent potential to the fullest. And in the process, we also allow A and B, other children, the other two children, to develop their potential to the fullest. Okay, without thinking of just using education system as a differentiator. Okay, um, I think I I'm particularly uh, uh, very also uh, interested in education because of my own personal experience. I went to Japan. The Japanese university is very different from uh, the, uh, the the Singapore uh, uh, type of university education. You know, examination is really not important in, uh, in Japanese university. You just need to pass. Again, and, uh, and, uh, and the passing is very relatively easy. If you listen to the lecture, you have absorbed the uh, basic knowledge, you will, you will pass. But what the, 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 the education system in the university of, in the Japanese university encourages for you to explore yourself, to explore the knowledge. So as a result, without an exam examination pressure in Japan, I was able to explore. So from economics, I go in, I, I'm actually, ma I, I actually major economics, but I spent time studying, studying about philosophy. I spent time reading all the books of the Greek philosophers, you know. I, I, I must confess that I, answer, I understand no more than 5% of the content at the time, but I, I did have a chance to, to study more. Okay, and, and then I branched into history, I branched into sociology. So I was able to study many, many things to my liking to make, to make, uh, 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 to make uh, uh, my understanding of economics uh, and then how economics can help society more wholesome. Okay, because economics alone cannot help society. You need politics, you need philosophy, you need to understand history. You need to understand sociology, you know, since there are a lot of things and not just one uh, branch of knowledge because today the knowledge is too specialized. Uh, so if you just stick, your, uh, stick to one branch of knowledge, then you'll find yourself to be very, uh, very limited uh, in, your, in your views, in my opinion. And then that will affect your, your, your recommendations of policies and your views. And then that in turn will affect uh, 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 the outcome uh, in society. So it is from my personal experience that I actually think that, uh, uh, that there's, some, uh, there's a lot of room for the education system to change. Elisha yeah. just asked, is being a politician harder than working in the finance ministry? Uh, ministry? Would, you, would you talk about that? <laughs> um, actually, in a way, yes. But also because of my, uh, my original training is actually in finance and in the corporate sector. And so when you go from the corporate sector and or for that matter, you're, you, you, are, you are a very private person from a private life to a public life, from a corporate sector to a, to a, a, a political sector, should I use the word, for lack of a better word, it is very different, okay? So, um, and uh, actually I'm still trying, I'm still uh, learning every day. Um, but what, what is uh, interesting about my learning so far and then, uh, uh, I enjoy what I'm doing so far is that one, besides able to uh, uh, serve people and at the same, and if I become a full MP the next round, then I will have even more opportunity to serve the people. Uh, but besides that, I think what is more, most important is that uh, I have to learn to be less, uh, 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 less, uh, uh, what do you call that? Huh? Uh, less dogmatic in my views. Okay. And, uh, because in politics, you need to, uh, to have your views accepted by more people. So as a result, you have to um, 
uh, uh, you have to uh, listen more and uh, you have to uh, incorporate the good points of other people into your thinking. And then before you can come up with a, a, a policy platform or views and opinions that is acceptable to the majority of the people, at least, if not all the people. So that process itself to me is like, polishing the, the, something like polishing the social quotient also, you know, or we call it political quotient. Huh? So uh, it, is, it is a process that I'm really uh, enjoying that uh, I have an opportunity now. And, and because human beings are like that, if there's no incentive to, to do that, you won't do it. So if I remain in corporate life or in the financial industry, I may be the, uh, I'm the uh, I'm a corporate executive, so even if I'm not the uh, managing director, very often I'm the leader of a team and, and other people will just listen to me because they want to do the work, right? And they want to get paid. So, but in politics, it is more than that. It is about convincing people, you know, and about uh, people accepting the views about, because all the things that we are doing, uh, in, the things that we're doing politic, in politics, is not like in corporate life where we just earn the money and we go home and lead our own private life. In politics, is whatever we do actually affect people's lives. It affects people's private lives at the, at the same time. So we cannot be just one view. We have to accommodate a lot of views. And then we come out. That's why consensus, public discourse is very important for the country and not be just decided by one small group of people. Okay. So that is the process that I'm really enjoying right now. But first, uh, before saying that, you know, uh, whether the government or some small group of people are just deciding everything from uh, for us, I have to learn myself not to be like one of them as well. So I have to uh, 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 learn, you know, to actually incorporate as many uh, uh, opinions and views of other Singaporeans as possible in my, in my overall scheme of uh, thinking. Yeah. So that is the difference. I hope that's a long window way of answering, but I hope that answers your question. Can I um, get yeah. You want to answer Beverly's question first? Uh, she has a question on what is some what of the company some, yeah. who use cheap labor, is it? And also, if is cheap labor uh, bad? <laughs> okay. Ask, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. You see, um, in terms of when we talk about economic competitiveness, uh, of course, we have to be cheaper than other people in order to be competitive, uh, especially cheaper relative to the value we can provide. So like, for example, if we are, we are doing a, a very sophisticated software program, we may be able to charge, let's say $100,000, okay? So, and few people can do the $100,000 kind of program. So we will be able to command $100,000 and, and our people will be able to be paid, you know, like, like $100,000, okay? So, but if we are doing very low value at, at the staff, that this year, this program may be worth $5,000, but next year, China has a cheaper program that's worth, that is selling at $4,000. Then as a result, we've got to compete ourselves further and further down the, in terms of price because we are unable to, to raise our value. So that's why in, com in competition, we should always groom ourselves and educate ourselves and, and we ourselves work hard to increase the value of our, uh, uh, the value that we can provide for our customers. Uh, maybe many of them foreigner custom, foreign customers. Uh, provide a better high value add product or service. But currently what we experience is that in Singapore, we are unable to upgrade ourselves. And the policies conducted by, uh, implemented by, by the government also do not quite encourage that. Because we, in order to encourage that, our companies must be doing that, right? But our companies are not encouraged to do that because they can just continue to do very low value at the start, although it has gone from 5,000 to 4,000, for example, in the market, but I rely on the cheap foreign labor to come in. Uh, and this cheap foreign labor, you know, is cheap. So even at $4,000, I still can make a profit. So I'm not going to upgrade myself. I have foreign labor, foreign cheap labor uh, to help me. So that is something that's, so as a result, that's not good for our economy because our, economy will not upgrade. And then by also bringing in the cheap uh, workers, you find that originally at $5,000 uh, selling the product, uh, at $4,000, uh, 
our Singaporean were originally working on the project. So they may be paid, okay, they are paid $5,000, for example. But then when the, when the product has gone down to $4,000, uh, the, uh, the employer wanted to maintain profit. They say, oh, the Singaporean is too expensive. Let's put in a foreigner. So the Singaporeans will lose his job. Or, uh, but some Singaporeans may still say, that, oh, we are prepared to take $4,000. But then many other Singaporeans we may not want to take the four thousand dollars. So what we are experiencing is that this influx of uh, I mean this bringing in foreign talent, uh, foreign uh, uh, workers or foreign uh, 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 PMETs we call foreign professionals will depress the wages of our Singaporeans. So as a result, although our economy, our com companies may be making profit and surviving, but our workers are losing jobs. And when the workers lose jobs, they require the government to help them. And so taxes have to go up because they have to pay more for the, to help the, the, the lower income Singaporeans. So as a result, to have a cheap labor economic strategy in the long run does not work for any country or economy. So that is, uh, that is the understanding and, and that's the experience we have. Uh, there's an understanding and the, the, from the theory of economics, and that is the actual experience uh, we have also experienced, we have also encountered in the uh, practice of uh, different kind of economic strategies. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. I think mean Grace, Grace Hans, yeah. Hans. Uh, yeah, I have it. Uh, we have talk, uh, you have talked about finance, and most finance courses, that one, right? Start at tertiary level. Has the government considered financial literacy for primary and secondary school levels? That one, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Actually, financial literacy is uh, is uh, should be taught uh, at uh, should be taught at uh, uh, the younger age, but um, uh, and it actually can be taught uh, with a bit more. Uh, uh, it, it can be actually introduced in ordinary lives, uh, and and it should not be taught in. Uh, uh, the kind of things that we taught in financial courses uh, in, in, uh, in a higher level. Um, in fact, um, a lot of the, uh, um, not only just finance, but a lot of things in our education system, in my opinion, can actually be, uh, be brought to a more reality level. For example, a lot of, uh, even I myself, uh, many years ago when when uh, I was trying to learn, uh, that is in uh, secondary two or sec secondary three. La. When we start to learn um, about, okay, maybe we say uh, the in internal combustion engine. La. You all know what is the internal combustion engine? This is the engine that's used in cars. La, okay. So when it was first thought about the internal combustion engine and all that, you find it very difficult to understand certain concepts. So if you, if you and, and currently we have a lot of resources, if we can actually bring in a model of the internal combustion engine into the class, okay, sec one or sec two, then I think it will enhance the learning of the student uh, very, very much. And when you talk about, for example, um, uh, a finance, for example, uh, I think at a younger level, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, 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 advisable or it is possible to actually uh, start telling the kids to, to understand uh, 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 spending and savings you know, when, they are, when they are very young. Uh, so it starts with that. And in Japan, for example, they do uh, teach their kids uh, something called the uh, uh, family budget notebook. You know? They encourage the kids uh, to actually put down what they, what, what they spend every day uh, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, one month, how much they spend, you know, and then if, they, if, if uh, certain spending uh, to, uh, avoidable, you know, can be saved up, you know, and all that. So uh, the, there's some uh, courses uh, conducted in, in Japan, uh, uh, the primary schools and all that along those lines. Uh. So um, I, I, I definitely think that to answer the question that, that we should start some financial literacy also, but I think besides financial literacy, there's a lot of other areas that we can actually enhance the reality of learning in school, apart from just financial. Yeah.